Okay. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the final seminar in the CITF Research Results and Implication Series, um, and the title of today's uh, seminar is COVID-19's Youngest Victims. Uh, next slide. Uh, my name is Tim Evans, and I'll be your moderator uh, today. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, and I'm also the inaugural director of uh, and Associate Dean of the School of Population and Global Health uh, at McGill University. Before we uh, we get started, I've been asked to share some instructions as we are providing simultaneous translation into French, and we'll have a bilingual question and answer period. Bienvenue à tous et à toutes uh, au dernier événement de la série des séminaires résultats de la recherche Welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Tim Evans, and I will be your moderator today. I am Executive Director of COVID-19 Task Force. Before we get started, I've been asked to share some instructions as we are providing simultaneous translation into French, and I will have a bilingual question and answer period. On of a globe. Choose off if you are bilingual uh, and want to only hear the live feed. English attendees, you should select the English option so you can hear the entire event in English. The presentations will be in English, but the question and answer period will be bilingual. Au bas de votre écran zoom, vous verrez l'icône d'un globe. Choisissez off. At the bottom of your screen, you will see an icon of a globe. Choose off if you're bilingual and want to only hear the live feed. Uh, to English attendees, you should select English options so that you can hear the entire event in English. The presentation will be in English, but the question answer period will be bilingual. Veuillez sélectionner votre langue préférée. Please now change to your selected language now. Okay, next slide. I would like to uh, begin with a land acknowledgement that I'm speaking to you from my place of work at McGill University, which is on the unceded territories of uh, the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose presence mark this territories and on which we have the privilege to hold this seminar today. Next. Um, just a little bit of background on the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Uh, we were established almost uh, three years ago in April 2020 um, with a mandate uh, to catalyze support uh, funding and knowledge on SARS-CoV-2 immunity for decision makers uh, federally, provincially, and territorially, uh, such that that information could uh, inform efforts to protect Canadians and minimize the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next. Uh, over this three-year period, uh, we have supported uh, about 120 studies across uh, Canada that are distributed uh, across our pre provincial territorial jurisdictions like this. And 14 of these studies have ex focused exclusively on pediatric uh, populations. Next. Uh, today's panelists uh, are all uh, experts uh, in COVID-19 as it relates to the pediatric populations. Uh, we have Stephen Friedman, uh, who is uh, from the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, a professor in child health and wellness and professor of pediatrics and emergency medicine at the Cumming School of Medicine, University of Calgary, and pediatric emergency medicine physician at the Alberta Children's Hospital. Welcome, Stephen. We have Manish Sandarangani, who is uh, the director of the Vaccine Evaluation Center at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute, an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases, the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia, and he's the physician lead family immunization clinic at the BC Children's Hospital. Welcome, Manish. Uh, 
We have Carolyn Quach Khan, who is a professor in the Department of Microbiology, Infectious Diseases and Immunology and Department of Pediatrics at Université de Montréal. She's a pediatric infectious diseases and medical microbiologist at the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire Saint-Justine and medical lead infection prevention and control at the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Saint-Justine. Bienvenue, Caroline. And we have Jim Kellner, who is a pediatric infectious diseases specialist, a professor of pediatrics at the University of Calgary, and he has been the leader of the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force Pediatric Network. Welcome, Jim. So um, we know that there has been uh, a huge spike in the number of infections among children and young adults in Canada, uh, particularly with the onset of the Omicron wave, as, it, as this slide shows. Uh, the green is the um, uh, zero to 19 age group, uh, just slightly lower, in terms of absolute numbers than the 20 to 39 age group. But if you look at that period relative to the rest of the pandemic, then the Omicron wave uh, was the one, uh, like for so many Canadians, uh, that spread infection uh, to uh, all parts of the country and all age groups, including <laughs> children. Next slide. Um, this. Um, has also been associated uh, for uh, a spike in, uh, in hospitalizations uh, and ICU admissions uh, for children and teens uh, during this same period. Uh, but interestingly, um, and uh, thankfully, uh, not uh, a spike uh, in uh, deaths in this age group. Next. If we look at the risk of SARS infection and COVID-19 hospitalization and death by age group, and we use as a reference standard uh, the uh, 18 to 29 year old group, uh, you can see that uh, those less than age 18, uh, zero to four and five to 17, based on Centers for Disease Control and Prevention data from February to 2023, um, have less cases, um, uh, are less likely to be hospitalized, and uh, have uh, very little evidence of increased risk of death. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our first presenter, uh, Dr. Sandarangani. Manish, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the study we've been doing in children and young adults in British Columbia called the SPRING study. So I just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you and I work at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute, which is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. And I'm very privileged and, and honored to be able to work and live on these lands. Um, so my disclosures, I have some salary funding from the BC Children's Hospital Foundation and from Michael Smith Health Research BC and project funding from various vaccine manufacturers with all of those funds being paid directly to my um, institute. So the objectives of our study, the SPRING study, or the SARS-CoV-2 prevalence in children and young adults in British Columbia, um, was to estimate the age-specific prevalence of infection with SARS-CoV-2 in children and young adults based on the presence of antibodies against the virus in their blood, and to look at what it was around those people with higher seroprevalence that was associated with, with this, particularly in those early times when all of the positive antibodies was from infection um, rather than just from vaccination. So we've conducted the study through various phases. So the first phase earlier in the pandemic was during over that winter, during 2020 to 2021. Um, the second phase was essentially the following sort of winter season. And then the third phase is currently still ongoing. 
it was a relatively simple study. So anyone who was willing to give consent um, or for the younger children with their parents or guardians were willing to give consent aged under 25 living in BC was eligible to be in the study. Um, for the data that I'm going to present to you for phase two, we restricted the analysis for today to those unvaccinated children under 10 um, with some of the older children and young adults already being vaccinated. And then in phase three, with vaccines being available for all age groups, they're, they're all included. Um, there wasn't any specific exclusion criteria for this study. So as I said, it was a relatively simple study. So we collected information from families with a survey, which they completed online through a REDCap platform. So this was um, a link was sent to them and they could log in on a computer or on their phones or tablet and complete the questions. And then the samples were actually also collected by people themselves. Um, and so they were collected from finger pricks. So a very small needle into the tip of the finger and a few drops of blood onto a card that was then mailed back to us. And so essentially people could um, complete this study from the comfort of their, their own home. They didn't need to come to the hospital or to the research institute or a lab or anything else to, to get the information. And then we analyze the, the data from the survey and the blood samples analyzed in the lab here and in collaboration with the BC Center for Disease Control. So during these early phases before vaccines were, were available, we found that the highest rates of infection were in the, the extremes of the ages that we were looking at. So the young, the young children under five, and then the young adults aged 20 to 24. Um, looking a bit more at the characteristics of our cohort, there was a slight predominance of females with 55% of our, our population being female. They were largely healthy with 84% having no underlying health conditions at all. Um, the ethnicity more or less reflected the, the ethnic diversity that's present in British Columbia, with the notable exception that we had very low numbers of Indigenous people in the study. In terms of the geographic distribution, um, as I mentioned, the, the fact that people could do this from their own homes meant we were able to reach out to the various parts of the province, but we still had a slight predominance of people living in the lower mainland of Vancouver and the Fraser Valley. Fraser Valley, sorry. So around 14% in the early times reported they'd been exposed to someone with a known positive acute COVID-19 test. And around 40% of the people had had a COVID test themselves, but a very low positivity rate at that time. So 3% had reported a previous positive test for COVID. Um, and at these early times of the pandemic, this was all by PCR. And then if we look a little bit more in detail at the different age groups, um, as I mentioned, the highest prevalence rates, the highest seropositivity rates were in these younger children, around 7% in the under fives, and just over 7% in the 20 to 24 year olds, um, with around 3 to 5% um, in, the, in the other age groups. If we look across British Columbia, the highest rates of positivity we saw was in Fraser Health with over 7%, and the lowest rates were in Northern Health um, of just under 3%. And then if we look at how this changed over time, so if we look in the first couple of phases here, we've got different age groups. So the naught to nine year olds, the under 10s, started off around 4% positivity, which maintained sort of four to 5% in that early part of the pandemic. And then later, later on, we saw this increase, um, a slight increase just before Omicron, and then after Omicron, a, a big increase. And, and this is now, this is going up to last May. And so it's now even higher, but essentially around just over 40%. Um, and the, the data for the other age groups were on the previous slides, but you could see the, the 20 to 24 year olds starting to go up um, a bit earlier with 23% even in that March to May 2021. And this is just reflected here. So in this early, early data is the whole cohort and then the naught to nine year olds. And you can see this increase associated with Omicron that Dr. Evans also showed on his slide. If we look at the, the factors that were associated with higher seroprevalence or the, what, what was related to people being infected, and there's a slight, um, typo on this slide, so apologies for that, but essentially it was higher in people of South Asian ethnicity. So you can see threefold higher in South Asian population compared to people with white ethnicity. And also those who had traveled internationally around just over one and a half times higher if they'd traveled internationally um, compared to people who had not traveled at all outside of Canada, or even within Canada or internationally. Um, and the 10 to 19 year olds had a slightly lower seroprevalence than the other age groups.
And then just to highlight, you know, we use this, this approach of using dried blood spots, which was adopted across many of the CITF studies. Um, and just to look at the value of that here. So there's a lot of numbers here, but uh, if we go through the, the first line, so this is, there's 38 people who we knew had tested positive to COVID-19 in the past, and 36 of those we picked up on our test. But what was more interesting to us was in the red boxes here, these 43 people who had a previous negative COVID-19 test and the 76 people who'd never had a COVID-19 test. So all of these people in our study didn't know they had had COVID until they'd taken part in the study. And so I think this was really showed that the added value of the approach that we were using to detect infections, um, picking up a lot of infections that previously had not been recognized. So in terms of the ongoing work, so I mentioned phase one and phase two were earlier in the pandemic. And um, there was around two and a half thousand individuals in both of these phases. And we now have an ongoing extension study where individuals from both phase one and phase two are having ongoing follow-up. So there's just over a thousand children and young adults in this ongoing follow-up. And as part of that, and in collaboration with some of the other CITF pediatric investigators, we're doing very detailed follow-up on around 200 children in the 5 to 11-year-old age group to look in great detail at their immune responses to COVID-19 vaccines. And then just looking at the most recent data, so this is sort of the, the most recent cut we've had. And so overall, the 0 to 19 year olds, just over half of the, the participants in this study were positive for infection acquired antibodies. So this is removing those who were positive, who had antibodies from vaccination. Um, and you can see some of the numbers in these are, are relatively small, but month by month as we go through from, from June until November here, and you can see November in all the age groups, it's over 50% and most of them 70 to 80%. Um, positive through infection. So the vast majority of these children and young adults, at least in British Columbia, um, have been infected with, with the virus at some point. And I think this has important implications for how we consider use of vaccines going, going forward. So, as I mentioned, we've picked up a lot of cases in our study that were not reported through the PCR testing or through the rapid antigen testing, um, as one might expect. So, these are people who we know have had infection because they have antibodies against the virus in their blood. Um, early on, when we were looking at infection-related um, positivity, then the highest rates we saw were in the youngest children and the, the young adult age group. And this, there was overall very low rates of positivity pre-Omicron, despite the relatively early returns to in-person schooling. So in British Columbia, um, schools went virtual from, from March of 2020, and then started going back to in-person schooling in June of 2020, um, earlier than a lot of other regions. And over the course of that time, we still saw relatively low seropositivity rates. And the, the increase was really associated with this Omicron wave that, that, we, that has swept through the globe. We also saw interestingly higher rates amongst the South Asian participants and the numbers in some of the other ethnic groups were relatively small, so we're not able to do really detailed analysis on that. Um, and this may have been due to selection bias and who volunteered to participate in the study. Um, despite, despite the fact that we were able to offer this study to people across British Columbia, we still had relatively low numbers of participants um, in northern British Columbia and in the indigenous communities, as I mentioned. Um, I've already mentioned that we've identified a large number of cases that were not detected through the provincial surveillance system. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge that with these dry blood spots, they're very relatively small sample volumes um, and the technical um, approaches that we have to use to get the blood from the card compared to a venous blood sample means that the very low levels of antibody may not be detected. So there, this is, I would say, a sort of conservative estimate of the, of the positivity rates in, in this population. So I just want a huge thanks. This has been an incredible amount of work from a number of people. Um, we've been collaborating closely with the Brit British Columbia Centre for Disease Control and have had incredible support from the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force and it's really great collaborations with the other paediatric investigators that you're going to hear from. Um, so I just want to thank the, the whole team for all of the work that it's taken over the last three years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manish. And uh, maintenant, on va prendre la Dr. Caroline Quach Tan. Uh, bienvenue. And Dr. Caroline Quach, welcome. Merci. Alors, uh, I'm presenting today on behalf of uh, Professor Kate Zitzer, who could not be here with us. Um, and so I'll take questions, and we'll do this presentation in English. 
Kit and I have no conflict of interest to declare relating to this study. So ANCORE is a longitudinal cohort study that began in October 2020, where we aim to estimate seroprevalence, seroconversion, and seroreversion of infection-induced anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in children and youth in Montreal. We also wanted to look at uh, participant characteristics associated with increased risk of seroconversion. And really similar to what uh, Manish has just presented, our data were collected uh, through questionnaires and fingerprint prick blood samples at four distinct time points that you see here on the slides. Um, just to mention that round three, although it did go up to February 2022, was mainly all collected before December 2021, so just before the Omicron wave. Um, emerged. You have here the um, characteristics of the study population by round of data collection. In the top row, you can see the total number of participants who provided a sample for each round and then breakdowns by um, study characteristics. You see also that there was a large decrease in our sample size after round one. Honestly, um, people who pricked themselves once uh, said that it was too much discomfort and so left the study, but we tried to um, reopen recruitment at rounds two and four, just to offset some of the loss to follow up. So we recruited the participants aged two to 17 through schools and daycares in four particular neighborhoods of Montreal which are characterized by varying racial and ethnic diversity, as well as socioeconomic status. And as a result, 10 to 14% of children had a parent who identified as a racial or ethnic minority, and 20 to 30% came from households with annual income below 100K per so here you see that um, the our seroprevalence results or the proportion of, of uh, children who had positive antibodies against uh, the virus, so SARS-CoV-2. Table, table two here shows a rise in an adjusted seroprevalence over time. So from almost 6% in round one to almost 60% um, in the last round that was after the emergence of Omicron. So really similar to what Manish has presented before uh, the uh, transmission among children really occurred with Omicron. As shown in the table also, um, we have a higher seroprevalence in children with a parent and identifying as a racial ethnic minority, as well as in those coming from households with annual income below 100K. What we don't show here is that in, in round four seroprevalence, we also had significantly higher seroprevalence in those that were two to four and those who were unvaccinated compared to reference categories. Um, a caveat, though, is that uh, it, there seems that uh, children who were vaccinated, even though infected, might not mount as good as an immune response to the um, antibody that is usually seen uh, typically after an infection. So here is the infection-inducer prevalence observed by age group and round of data collection. Although we see a little bit of variation in seroprevalence in, in rounds one, two, and three, this really, again, highlights changes in seroprevalence at round four in all age groups. Um, at this time, seroprevalence was also significantly higher in the two to four compared to the reference group of 12 to 18 year olds. And again, this is uh, the interpretation of the higher transmission of Omicron in children. So here we present our conversion findings from round four. So of the 396 children who were not yet seropositive in round three and who provided a sample in round four, 231 or a bit over 50% became seropositive for a SARS-CoV-2 infection. If we take their follow-up time into account, this represents a crude seroconversion rate of 139 person uh, per 100 person year which is shown in the first row of the table. If we take that um, a little bit simpler, it means that if we were to follow 200 children over six months, on average, 139 of them would zero convert. This rate is approximately nine to 12 times higher than that of earlier rounds, reflecting the increased transmissibility of Omicron. In the table, you can also see um, there are zero conversion rates in the first column and the relative risk of ser seroconversion in the second column, according to the various characteristics. Similar to our round four seroprevalence findings, 
And unlike the other rounds before, we saw a 36% higher circonversion rate in the two to four um, relative to the oldest age group. There was also a 24% lower rate of seroconversion in the five to 11 year old children. This can largely be explained by age group differences in vaccination, as we saw that children were that were vaccinated with at least one dose had a 57% decrease rate of seroconversion. Finally, females and children of parents identifying as a racial or ethnic minority had higher rates of seroconversion compared to males and children of parents. Finally, here are findings on SARS-CoV-2 seroreversion. Um, I think uh, you know, various groups have shown that uh, if you follow people who get infected in time, eventually we cannot measure the uh, antibody anymore. So this was done using data up through round three with most data collected prior to the emergence of the Omicron variants. And so we are following here 141 children who were seropositive at round one or two and provided at least one additional sample. And we wanted to see whether they remained positive or not. So the lower part of the figure um, in the, at the bottom uh, represent the number of seropositive children that remain at risk of seroreversion. So it means that they were still seropositive um, up to day 400. In the top part of the figure, the dark gray line represents the estimated likelihood of remaining positive up to a given point in time. The y-axis is the probability of remaining seropositive and the x-axis is the follow-up time in days. The dashed line represents the medium time to seroreversion, which is estimated at about eight months. So which means that um, at eight months, the median of uh, the, the, the children had lost their um, antibodies. A few other time points of interest are shown in the table. So the likelihood of remaining seropositive at six months was 68%, but fell to 42% at 12 months. And so even though antibodies are only one measure of the immune response, these seroversion findings could have implications for interpretation of data, but also considering vaccination schedules and the importance of hybrid immunity over time. And so in conclusions, the infection acquired sort of prevalence has, prevalence has risen from approximately six to 60%, reflecting the evolving pandemic. After the emergence of Omicron, the seroconversion rate or the rate to, uh, of becoming seropositive for um, antibodies was nine to 12 times higher than in the previous rounds of data collection. Before Omicron, the median time to seroreversion was about eight months, and so further study will explore antibody waning, reinfection, and hybrid immunity. And finally, we'd like to thank the children and parents of Angkor, the daycares, the schools, and the school boards who allowed us to do this study. Of course, this work is mainly that of uh, Dr. Zinser um, and of the team. Uh, you have the partners and funders, and uh, we'd like to just thank everybody for allowing us to do this work over the past uh, three years. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Dr. Quach. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Quach. Uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Friedman. He'll be sharing the breadth of COVID-19 research done by the Pediatric Emergency Research Canada Network. Over to you, Stephen. You're on mute, Stephen. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. Um, and on behalf of Pediatric Emergency Research Canada, a network consisting of Canada's 15 pediatric tertiary care centers, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to describe a few of the COVID-related studies conducted by our network. Um, our network held an annual conference at the end of January 2020, and we realized at that time the pandemic was lurking, and we immediately began to plan studies that I will be presenting today. Initially, it was unclear what impact the pandemic would have on emergency department patient volumes. While we initially were worried we would see a sharp spike in ED visits, what actually happened was in fact completely unexpected. In an 11th site interrupted time series observational study, comparing the first two months of the pandemic with preceding years, we actually observed a 58% decline in the number of ED visits relative to what we expected to see during the early pandemic period um, with actually higher concomitant acuity seen during that period of time. 
The network also launched and led a 41 site study focused on expanding our understanding of the risk of severe COVID outcomes in children with COVID-19. This study included several unique features that made the database particularly robust. Notably, it was a prospective cohort study with historical data provided by caregivers during individual interviews, and the study included 14-day and three-month follow-up surveys. The study included children recruited between March 2020 and June 2021 and defined a severe outcome as the need for intensive interventions during hospitalizations, such as the administration of inotropes or positive pressure ventilation, a diagnosis indicating severe organ impairment or death. Included in this analysis were 3,222 SARS-CoV-2 positive children, of whom 79% were discharged uh, from the emergency department, sorry, 79% uh, on the left there were discharged from the emergency department. On the right, as you can see, 21% were hospitalized. Of those who were hospitalized in the bottom right, 14% had severe outcomes and 0.6% died. Amongst those who were discharged on the left, 320 or 13% returned for care. And of those who returned for care, 16% were hospitalized. And in this group of children, 0.5% experienced severe outcomes and there were no deaths. We then used a multivariable model to identify independent risk factors for severe outcomes. One of the most interesting findings was that the participants enrolled in Canada were much less likely to experience a severe outcome with an odds ratio of 0.11 and 95% confidence intervals of 0.05 to 0.23, with the United States serving as the referent group. While the exact reason for this is unclear, we do need to keep in mind that different testing strategies between countries, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, with Canada having extensive testing, while in many US sites, testing was limited to those children who were being hospitalized and sometimes to those requiring intensive care unit admission. We also found that compared to children less than one year of age, children greater than five years of age, and even more so the subgroup greater than 10 years of age, was at increased risk for severe outcomes. Other risk factors of interest that we found included having a chronic underlying condition, a previous episode of pneumonia, and also children presenting with four or more symptoms at the time of the e index ED visit were also more likely to have a severe outcome. As studies such as ours began to emerge, it was noticed that the risk of severe outcomes seemed to vary dramatically between reports. So to better clarify the true risk of severe outcomes in children, we conducted a systematic review and a meta-analysis of the published literature. We included 118 studies and over 3 million pediatric participants. When we looked at what is best described as an outpatient population on the left in this bar plot, we found that only 0.3% of infected children were hospitalized and only 0.3, sorry, 3% of infected children were hospitalized and 0.3% of children required ICU admission. On the other hand, among children tested in a hospital setting, which is in the middle uh, of the bar plot, 24% were admitted and 1.3% experienced a severe outcome in green. However, when we look at the right-hand side, which is only focusing on hospitalized patients, 4.2% in green experienced a severe outcome and 1.1% died, uh, which is reflected in the yellow color. One of the other issues that had been emerging in the literature was about the sensitivity of what we assumed to be our gold standard test for acute SARS-CoV-2 infection, a nasopharyngeal swab tested using RT-PCR. However, in discussion with our medical microbiology colleagues, we'd come to realize that there was a potentially more sensitive test available, namely digital droplet PCR, this approach, uh, which is known, also known as DDPCR, uh, was, was incorporated into a study where we compared the sensitivity of RT-PCR to DDPCR, and we found that the RT-PCR sensitivity to be only 84%, with 95% confidence intervals of 74 to 91, while that of DDPCR was 97%, considering either test positive as being a true positive. As depicted in the figure on the right, the gene copy number of RT-PCR negative DDPCR positive samples reflected by the histogram plot on the left was significantly lower than those of the concordant positive samples on the right. Thus, this analysis made it clear that RT-PCR sensitivity drops off significantly when the viral load in children is very low. As the pandemic continued to evolve, 
there was a need to evaluate alternative technologies and approaches to specimen collection and testing. In particular, there was a desire and a need to have a rapid point of care test that could also be used with specimens that were less traumatizing to children to collect. It had become increasingly clear in the emergency department that children and caregivers were declining to have nasopharyngeal swabs performed, and often they would decline testing even when clinically indicated. This was becoming increasingly challenging, particularly when uh, it was important for diagnostic accuracy, as well as for public health surveillance. So to address this concern, we evaluated the diagnostic accuracy of the Abbott ID Now, a point of care PCR device with a 10 minute turnaround time using bu buccal swabs collected either by caregivers of young children or patients themselves in adolescent years who are able to do their own swabs. And we compared these samples to nasopharyngeal swabs tested using standard laboratory PCR, which were collected as part of standard of care. This study was conducted in 15 emergency departments and enrolled 2,882 children. Unfortunately, as depicted in the table on the right, the sensitivity was lower than what we had hoped for, which was only 58%, however, the specificity was 99% and the positive negative predictive values were 94% each. Importantly, however, we also asked parents to rate the pain and discomfort associated with the two testing methods. And we found that although only 12% of the nasopharyngeal swabs were associated with minimal pain and discomfort on the left in the figure here, 93% rated the buccal swab as having only minimal pain and discomfort as depicted on the right in green. As such, this highlights the importance of considering pain and discomfort when designing diagnostic testing approaches for mass screening, as was the case at times during the COVID pandemic. In the early days of the pandemic, concerns also began to emerge regarding the post-COVID condition, um, including in children. And in our initial 41-site study, we had built in a three-month follow-up survey to evaluate ongoing or persistent symptoms. As such, among the 1,884 SARS-CoV-2 positive children who completed 90-day follow-up in our study, we were able to estimate the prevalence of the post-COVID condition, and we could also compare this to 1,701 SARS-CoV-2 test-negative match controls. Among the SARS-CoV-2 positive children, the prevalence of the post-COVID condition at 90 days was 5.8%. However, this reached almost 10% among children who were hospitalized. However, when we compared this number to the test negative children who were matched based on several characteristics, the difference was only 1.6% with 95% confidence intervals of 0.2% to 3%, which really is more reflective of the added value of COVID relative to other illnesses presenting similarly to children who were tested for COVID in the emergency department. We then conducted a regression analysis to identify independent factors associated with the development of the post-COVID condition. We found that children greater than 10 years of age, those with greater than four symptoms at the time of presentation for care, and being hospitalized for greater than two days were all independently associated with the development of the post-COVID condition. In our most recent study, we compared symptoms and healthcare resource use among children seeking emergency department care in 14 of Canada's pediatric EDs. In this study, we enrolled 1,440 SARS-CoV-2 positive children, all of whom completed 14-day follow-up. As depicted in the histogram plot on the right, the alpha variant of concern shown in Burgundy had the fewest symptoms, in the, which is depicted on the left here, at the time of ED presentation, with 36% present, presenting with three or fewer symptoms, whereas all the other three variants of concern, namely the original type, Delta and Omicron, had a greater number of symptoms at the time of the ED presentation. Moreover, when we looked at healthcare resource use, comparing uh, that between the different variants identified throughout the COVID pandemic, Omicron, which is on the right, um, uh, in depicted, uh, sorry, on the far right of all the four variants in this uh, histogram plot, consume the greatest resources. I would note, children infected with Omicron were most likely to experience an ED revisit, depicted in red, have a chest X-ray performed, predicted to, in Burgundy, receive IV fluids, shown in uh, teal, and to receive steroid treatment, which is shown in yellow in the emergency department setting. Thus, research conducted in Canada's pediatric EDs by the Pediatric Emergency Research Canada Network has evaluated the impact the pandemic has had on ED visits, identified the frequency of and predictors of severe outcomes in children, evaluated the sensitivity of RT-PCR in this population, 
and the frequency of the post-COVID condition in children. And lastly, we have characterized the varying clinical impacts of the variants of concern that have emerged over time. Obviously, none of this work would be possible without an amazing team. And for, for us, it begins with our network, which has made all of this possible with the support of our national coordinators, the site investigators, and our site coordinators, as well as our participants and their families. We're also indebted to our funders, including the COVID Immunity Task Force, who have made these projects possible. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. And uh, uh, we will now uh, move on to uh, Dr. Jim Kellner, who also leads the CITF uh, uh, Pediatric Network, uh, who will be presenting the results uh, from his Alberta Childhood COVID-19 cohort. Dr. Kellner, Jim, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Tim. And it's a real pleasure to be here today uh, with some of my highly accomplished uh, uh, colleagues from the uh, CITF Pediatric Network. I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, Dr. Evans uh, for his uh, support from the start of the uh, creation and support for the Pediatric Network, um, even uh, within uh, COVID leaders across the, um, oh boy, something's happening to the slides. Even uh, within the uh, CITF leadership, uh, <clears throat> there wasn't a strong recognition of the importance of, um, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections in children early on. And I think uh, as time progressed, uh, the, the need for uh, uh, research into uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections in children became more and more evident. And uh, uh, Tim had a really important role in uh, supporting the creation of this network. So um, on to the next slide. Okay, so I'm speaking from Calgary, where I work and live, and um, here is a typical acknowledgement that I would make. I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Shinaki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. And the city of Calgary is also home to Métis uh, Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Here are my disclaimers, um, and I uh, have uh, support from a variety of uh, public uh, uh, agencies as well as pharmaceutical companies to support uh, research uh, grants and clinical trials. All this funding goes to the University of Calgary to support research operations with no funding coming to myself. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, briefly about the um, AB3C study or Alberta uh, childhood COVID-19 cohort uh, longitudinal seroepidemiology study, uh, which was a study that was run concurrently as uh, a, 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 along the timelines of the other studies that we've uh, heard about uh, today. So um, <clears throat> this study started in the summer of 2020 um, when we uh, rapidly enrolled a cohort of about 1,035 children from the Calgary area, including 118 who had had a prior COVID uh, or SARS-CoV-2 infection at the time and uh, 917 who had not been infected. Um, <clears throat> these children, a little bit different than some of the other studies, uh, these children came to our research clinic uh, at the Alberta Children's Hospital about every six months for up to five visits from August of 2020 till September of uh, 2022. And at each visit, they had a venous blood collection uh, for antibody tests. Um, they also completed a survey, um, online health and demographic survey, and we collected data um, about their laboratory testing for SARS-CoV-2 infections. Um, and then um, once vaccinations were available, um, for children, um, they self-reported vaccination, and then we also checked our provincial uh, vaccine registry. <clears throat> Overall, of the uh, 1,035 children, we had about 89% um, of children uh, completed four or five visits and uh, coming to the clinic and um, where the blood was collected with, for, with venous blood sampling, but a lot of numbing cream was used and it uh, made it a lot more acceptable uh, for getting repeat testing done, even though it mean, meant a visit to the hospital. So uh, just highlight a few of our, um, uh, uh, some of our data that has uh, come out and uh, um, uh, uh, a bunch of the data that I'll present in the next few minutes here will be sure why that's going forward like that. Um, need to go back to my slides. I'll just 
Okay, we're at that side, please. Maybe um, if you could go forward two slides, please. I mean, I'll just ask if you could advance the slides. I'm not sure. Yeah, <clears throat> have to go back several slides. Back one more, back. Back one more, please. Back in one more. Okay, please stop at that slide. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I was just uh, saying that uh, uh, some of this data is uh, uh, will be in print in the next uh, few days in the uh, art research article in the journal PLOS One and uh, uh, some other publications coming up. So um, <clears throat> just wanted to hear, this is highlighting of children who hadn't had a SARS-CoV-2 infection before um, the uh, um, entry into the study. This is the proportion of children who developed either a PCR um, proven or rapid test proven uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in a subsequent time. And the bottom line is very few children got SARS-CoV-2 infections before the Omicron wave, sort of highlighted by the dotted line there. And then once the Omicron wave uh, started, uh, then a much higher proportion of children got uh, infections, but not all children got infections, but a much higher proportion got infections. And it was all during uh, the Omicron wave. Uh, next slide, please. So we measured the two kinds of antibodies. First, the nucleocapsid antibodies, and um, these are the our anti-N. These are the ones that are formed after SARS-CoV-2 infection, but not after vaccination. And what we found, like others have found, is that they, these antibodies don't always develop in children, and that um, fewer of, uh, of the tests that were positive early on are positive after about five months. And so what this uh, graph shows on the right here is in 50-day increments, um, the proportion of children um, who had had a positive PCR test, we're not including the uh, asymptomatic children here, but the proportion who had had a positive PCR test for a SARS-CoV-2 infection, who had a positive nucleocapsid test, and only a peak of about 75% of children ever had a positive nucleocapsid test. And then by 151 days or about five months, you can see it drops off quite a bit. And by 200 days out or more, um, it uh, drops off to less than 20%. Of note, however, a small number of children, um, even two and a half years out, still have a positive nucleocapsid test. So in a small number of children, that test will stay positive for a long time, but on, on, on balance, it drops off uh, quite precipitously, especially after uh, uh, five months. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, on the other hand, these are the results for children um, who had a positive PCR test and then had um, uh, a testing for the spike antibody, which can be formed at either after infection or after vaccination. Now, these numbers shown here are only for children who are unvaccinated. And um, uh, the proportion positive for children who are vaccinated and had an infection were uh, stayed rate right at about 95 to 100% throughout. But for children who are unvaccinated, and had um, a positive spike, a higher proportion as seen in the graph on the right, again in 50 day increments, uh, were positive initially and then remain positive at, at um, uh, sort of in the 80 to 90% range, well out. And this graph goes, not sure what happened there. Yes, the graph red bars, please. And this graph goes out to 350 days, but again, we have children, we have results from about two and a half years out. And uh, by at about two and a half years out, um, almost all the results that we have are still uh, positive, small numbers by that point, but it's positive. So the anti-spike, which comes after infection um, uh, or after uh, vaccination uh, stays positive uh, for a long time. Whether that correlates with immunity remains to be seen. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, vaccination uh, in uh, children. And as was highlighted by others, um, the COVID-19 vaccines for children became available as seen on the left side of the graph here at, at different time periods uh, for different age groups. Uh, for those 12 and above in May of 21, then later in November of 21, for those from five to 11, and in just July, 2022, for those from uh, six months to four years. 
The results uh, on these next couple of slides are just for children age five and above because so few children had had a chance, under five had had a chance to be vaccinated by the time of our last um, uh, uh, study visit in September uh, and October, August and September of 2022. So by, by September 2022, 88% of the participants in our study age five and above had had at least one dose and almost all had had two doses of vaccines. It was a lower proportion in five to 11 year old children uh, compared to 12 to 18 year old children. The table on the right shows a, a multi-variate uh, analysis where all these factors were considered at once. So look at factors that are, were associated with being more or less likely to have been um, vaccinated. And this is what came out with the multivariate analysis is that older children, 12 to 18, uh, were more likely, uh, were had a higher likelihood of uh, being vaccinated than uh, younger children, five to 11. Um, and then skipping down, uh, uh, children who had had um, previous influenza vaccines were more likely, uh, had a higher likelihood of getting, uh, of receiving a COVID-19 vaccine than children who had never had an influenza vaccine before. And then um, uh, children who are Asian and other non-Black um, uh, 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 Canadians uh, compared with uh, 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 white Canadians had a higher likelihood of being um, uh, of having received a vaccine. And then <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, children who had had a previous uh, COVID-19 infection compared to no previous infection had a lower likelihood of being vaccinated, despite the recommendation that everybody should get vaccinated uh, regardless of vaccine. Uh, next slide, please. And the last couple of information slides here look at sort of um, concerns expressed by uh, families um, uh, before a vaccine was available and then as vaccines became available. So this first slide shows some concerns expressed in the spring of 2021 before any vaccine was available for uh, uh, children. Uh, and, um, and then in the um, two columns on the right looks at uh, children who were vaccinated by September of 2022 compared to children who had not been vaccinated by uh, September of 2022. And sort of lists the most uh, common concerns that were expressed with vaccine safety being the number one concern expressed and um, uh, concerns around the number of people who had received the vaccines, the development of vaccines, um, and um, uh, whether the vaccines were necessary for their child or not. And what you can see here, and I think, you know, the, uh, um, the, uh, a higher proportion of the parents and guardians of children who hadn't been vaccinated expressed concerns. But, and I think this is important, is that um, uh, a considerable proportion of children who had their, uh, uh, of parents who had their children vaccinated also expressed some concerns. And this really reflects my longstanding experience with, uh, with children and families, which is that even for the very large silent majority of uh, uh, families who ensure that their children receive all their routine vaccines, they have logical and reasonable concerns about vaccines that come, especially new vaccines. Um, despite that, we're uh, willing uh, to have their children vaccinated. Um, next slide, please. And now this just shows amongst those who are not vaccinated, uh, the evolution in concerns. And so here, it's a bit different than the last slide, the two columns on the right, um, are um, uh, the uh, concerns expressed in spring of 2021, and then the concerns expressed in the far right at, in the summer and uh, early fall of 2022, and the changes in those. And, and the main thing that emerged was that um, people over time who didn't vaccinate, have their children vaccinated, um, uh, a higher proportion uh, felt that the vaccine was not necessary for their child, um, still had concerns about safety, and then um, uh, the um, Point of having had a COVID-19 infection, uh, despite the recommendations for getting vaccine, people uh, uh, didn't have their children vaccinated for that reason, or, or that was a reason um, or a concern that people had. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, as others have shown, and as we all know, COVID-19 was, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections were uncommon in children before the Omicron wave starting in December 2021. Then most, but not all, became infected over time. Um, the anti-spike antibodies remain positive indefinitely so far in most children after vaccination with without uh, uh, after vaccination and or infection. The anti-nucleocapsid antibodies, which we uh, would like to be able to use to help distinguish between vaccine and uh, infection, decline after a few months um, and are not a reliable measure uh, in the long term of, of previous infection. 
And then finally, despite reasonable concerns about COVID-19 vaccines, uh, 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 most of the children in our um, cohort were vaccinated. And the main factors associated with reduced likelihood of vaccination were prior COVID-19 infection, despite the recommendations and younger age. So uh, next slide, please. So I just want to acknowledge um, our AB3C study team, all my core investigators and the study staff and the wonderful people working with the study and um, the, those who supported this study the uh, for, through funding, the Government of Alberta, the Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute and uh, Genome Alberta for a different component of the study that I didn't speak about today. Thanks very much for your attention. I'll turn it back to Dr. Evans. Thank you very much, Dr. Kellner, um, and thanks to all of the presenters. Um, I think there's some very consistent results uh, coming across these four studies. Um, uh, relatively low single-digit seroprevalence prior to Omicron in virtually all the pediatric populations, um, but uh, post-Omicron or during the Omicron uh, wave, uh, uh, massive increase in infection, uh, 10 times the zero conversion rate, or between 9 and 12 times. Uh, this seemed to be distributed differently, and uh, perhaps in relationship to uh, the uh, levels of vaccination, younger children are less vaccinated, uh, but also, very importantly, racial ethnic minorities and lower socioeconomic status. Children seem to uh, be more at risk to infection. Uh, we saw interesting results on how we measure humoral immunity uh, uh, over time, and uh, what's called the time to zero conversion. It appears the anti-spike antibody um, uh, seems to last a little bit longer. That can get uh, elevated due to vaccination or infection, whereas the anti-nucleocapsid antibody seems to wane uh, uh, a little bit more uh, quickly. Uh, the questions on what that means for overall immunity uh, uh, remain open. Um, we saw evidence on vaccination from Alberta with high rates of vaccination, um, particularly amongst older children, um, and, uh, and, and uh, importantly, amongst the non-white population. Uh, we saw some interesting data on vaccine hesitancy amongst parents for their children, concern about side effects initially, uh, and then uh, a little later thinking that it may not be necessary for children. And we had a whole spectrum of data related to emergency room visits uh, from Dr. Friedman uh, on the levels of hospitalization and severe outcomes. I think very interestingly, we didn't get the full story, but Canada seems to be doing relatively well on severe outcomes uh, of, uh, uh, for in, in children in hospital um, uh, relative to other countries. Uh, we saw some nice precision on better diagnostic regimens, uh, the, the digital droplet being better than the reverse transcriptase PCR, but also uh, user-friendly uh, uh, diagnostics for children in terms of the self-administered buccal swab uh, and that how um, uh, the various variants of concern uh, uh, were associated with fewer, in the context of the earlier variants, uh, to greater use of uh, hospital resources in the context of the Omicron wave. So a, a very rich set of results um, from our panelists, and I'd like to thank them all for excellent, uh, excellent presentations. So we now open it up uh, for... Uh, questions and answers, and um, I think we will go to the chat for those. Um, and um, I'm seeing uh, a bunch of questions. Uh, my goodness. So we'll begin with Dr. Uh, Sandrangani. Uh, your positive serological testing results for COVID-19 seem very low. How does the dry blood spot test compare to using fresh serum for the same individuals uh, compare in terms of uh, uh, diagnostic uh, yield? And does your test rely specifically on detection of antibodies against the nucleocapsid protein? Um, yeah, th thanks for the question. So I, I don't know, I, I don't know if I agree with the statement that they seem very low. I think our our rates of positivity compared with the provincial PCR testing reports, you know, when PCR was being used widely, were 
consistently about two to three times higher. Um, Pre-Omicron, our rates are also similar to another study done by um, Dr. Skronsky at BCCDC. Um, Post-Omicron, the estimates from that study were, were higher than ours. Um, and I think there's various reasons reasons for that, but, but for time, I won't necessarily go into that. I think that, you know, there's different population and different sampling strategy, um, essentially. In terms of the assay itself, so we don't have serum from the individuals in our study, but we have previously published um, a validation of the DBS approach that we have used with paired samples, and we had a sensitivity of around 80%. Um, and a specificity of almost 100%. So I think we do acknowledge that we're, we're probably missing some um, people, particularly those with slightly lower levels of antibodies. Um, but I think that's still, you know, reasonably good and, and sort of for the for the ability for the trade-off is that we're able to recruit people who are not able to get to um, somewhere where they can have their blood sample collected with a trained phlebotomist. So so I think that for the purposes of trying to be more representative, we're willing to accept accept that trade-off. And then in terms of the antibody targets, um, so the panel that we use tested for spike protein um, RBD, so which is a Part of the spike protein and also nuclear capsid to be positive in people who are unvaccinated they had to be positive for the spike protein we found that people who are nuclear capsid positive or rbd positive alone with a negative spike that wasn't a reliable combination with the dbs and so they they were spike positive and then for those who'd been vaccinated they had to be both spike and nuclear capsid positive to be a sort of infection associated um positivity thanks great, great. thank you very much dr sandrangani uh, the next uh, couple of questions are for Dr. Friedman. Uh, so, uh, Stephen, get ready. Um, the first is, what is the difference between how DD PCR and RT PCR are performed, and why is DD PCR more sensitive? Yeah. So, my first disclaimer: I'm not a medical microbiologist or not, or an infectious disease expert. So. Uh, but uh, basically, at a simple level, my understanding essentially is that it takes the specimen and instead of running one RT or one PCR reaction on it, it splits the specimen into thousands of droplets and runs that reaction on all thousands of droplets. And so basically, with one test, you're getting thousands of tests looking for evidence or presence of the nucleic acid that you're looking for. Um, and so it's better at detecting low levels of antigen or, or sorry, uh, nucleic acid in the specimens that are being analyzed. Um, and so because of that, because you're running thousands on a given specimen, you get greater sensitivity. And so it's just by splitting it in and looking for really low levels, which then become more concentrated in a smaller specimen, then you amplify it in that specimen that you're more likely to detect the signal, which you may otherwise miss in standard PCR. It also doesn't really, other piece I'll add is it doesn't, you know, with um, a standard PCR, there's a cycle threshold cutoff that you'll use to declare it a positive or a negative, or I guess there's also a, uh, an indeterminate level. With the DDPCR, it's actually quantifying viral load and basically any positive is considered a positive. So if you find any nucleic acid, so you don't really use a, a higher level CT or basically a lower viral load cutoff point. Great, thanks for that. Um, uh, this is again uh, directed towards Dr. Friedman, but uh, there may be others uh, on the call who, who may have some views on this, which is what symptoms were monitored in your study with different SARS-CoV-2 variants? Has there been a change in symptoms through time? So I think that is, are the different variants of concern associated uh, with different symptoms amongst uh, children who get infected? Yeah, so um, we designed the survey early on, right at the start of the COVID pandemic back in 2020, and it was very generic and captured. Basically, we asked proactively uh, during our survey and data collection phase um, from the caregivers whether their child had X symptoms. And these symptoms included anything from systemic things like fever, irritability, drowsiness, lethargy, to um, upper respiratory symptoms such as cough, runny nose, sore throat, lower respiratory symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath, wheezing, um, are they coughing up sputum, uh, GI symptoms, so vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pains. We looked at neurologic symptoms. We asked about um, headaches or any seizures, uh, musculoskeletal symptoms like joint pains, arthritis, myalgias, and then also a little bit about their eating habits. So decreased oral intake, evidence of dehydration, we also looked at skin changes. So especially we added those on when Miss C emerged, I should say. 
looking at skin changes, so conjunctivitis, uh, rash, uh, changes to the to lips and oral mucosa. So that was kind of really the, the spectrum of what we asked for. And what we did in our analysis is we took all of these symptoms and um, we ran multivariate models to look and see if the symptoms did change in addition to the data that I showed, which was that the number changed. We also looked at whether the symptoms changed and they did. And the one caveat I'll say is we never added on Strider to our questionnaire. Um, because Omicron really was the first variant to present with any strider. And that was really at the tail end of our data collection phase. So um, we didn't collect that data specifically, but we did find that um, Omicron and Delta were more likely to be associated with fever and cough, um, and that the Delta also had more upper respiratory tract symptoms, but that Omicron in addition to the strider, which we, as I said, I, I didn't capture, which anecdotally we know it was more likely to cause, Omicron also was more likely to be associated with systemic symptoms, so fever, lethargy, irritability, as well as lower respiratory tract symptoms. So in general, like the picture that we were seeing is that the kids getting tested with Omicron in particular were more likely to have more symptoms, more lower respiratory, more systemic symptoms than what we saw in the earlier uh, phase. Great, thanks, Dr. Friedman. And Miss C uh, is uh, not necessarily known to everybody. Mm. Uh, could you just tell us what that is? And I'm a runner, so I associate Strider with running more quickly. But could you also just tell us what that is? For sure. Uh, maybe I'll start with Strider. So Strider is a um, a symptom that really reflects some um, swelling or inflammation in the upper airways. Um, particularly in the vocal cord region. Uh, we have seen that historically for, for decades with certain viruses. It's very typical of parainfluenza, um, being most notable for causing it. And they, it's something called croup is the syndrome that we would uh, attribute it to. Um, we typically see it in the winter months, usually in young children, anywhere between about you know, six months and about two or three years of age. Um, and those children tend to present with the most severe symptoms. We actually... Um, and it sounds basically like, <gasps> so basically you're, you're taking deep breaths in against a little bit of a narrowed windpipe essentially. And um, that is treated with uh, steroids as well as a um, vasoconstrictor if needed, if children are more severe to decrease the inflammation. Um, and actually we didn't see Strider vanished for two years um, during public health precautions and with the other COVID variants um, because pyroinfluenza like other non-COVID viruses essentially vanished from um, circulating in the pediatric population. And then in the early or the uh, in November, December 2022, we started to see it reemerge and case reports of it happening. And then it was actually quite common in children with Omicron. But um, what I was saying is we didn't add that onto our service. We don't have the data related to our database because it was just, we couldn't move in the real time of the COVID pandemic. Um, the second question, or I'll flip it around. The first question was about Miss C. Um, so, multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children um, is a is a constellation syndrome that presented. Um, we got, began to see it shortly after the first case reports of COVID in children, about two three months later, um, and it actually presented quite severely in children who um, were coming to the emergency department with multiple days of fever, rash, sometimes red eyes, often abdominal pain, uh, vomiting being quite common. And um, this, um, and the problem with this syndrome is it also can affect the heart and the blood vessels leading to the heart causing aneurysms or impaired cardiac function. And so the children often presented with low blood pressures, hypotension, requiring intensive care unit admission, and were quite sick and it was a novel entity, um, although it did appear and it's similar to something we've seen for decades that we believe is treated by other viruses called Kawasaki disease, which presents relatively similarly, although a bit different phenotype. So the children with Miss C were older um, and, uh, and uh, we did use similar treatments to Kawasaki disease, um, but they tended to have more hypotension than we typically would see with Kawasaki disease. Um, but because of that, the emergence of Miss C early on in the pandemic, we did modify our database to try to ca start capturing some of those symptoms, such as the rash, the red eyes, um, and other features that were not necessarily attributable to acute COVID um, or what were, was being seen out of um, China with, with the early reports upon which we designed our database. And also, it doesn't tend to occur as often in adults. 
Um, and so that uh, really was that the added feature. Oh, I should add it, it typically occurs several weeks after a COVID infection. So it's kind of a post-COVID multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Um, and thankfully we're not seeing very much of it anymore. I, I didn't report it in relation, but I believe others have published that the rate of seeing MIS-C in relation to the Omicron variant is dramatically lower um, than it was with the original and alpha types. Great, Th thanks uh, Dr. Friedman um, for that and uh, uh, very, very helpful uh, explanation. Before we move on to the next question, I'm just wondering if any of the other panelists want to comment on the evolution of symptomatology, as I know many of you are clinicians and you saw that in various types of uh, various periods during the pandemic. Anybody, anybody want to make a comment on that? Well, Tim, I'll speak just very briefly. Uh, you know, so <clears throat> our study uh, reflected a, the very mildest end of the spectrum. Um, you know, out of about 600 children who got a, a, a SARS-CoV-2 infection, there were only four emergency department visits and only one hospitalization. So uh, the vast majority had SARS-CoV-2 infections with symptoms, but they were mild symptoms and, um, and didn't result even in emergency department visits. Um, we uh, looked at symptoms of uh, children who were tested at up to five time points between each of the visits. Um, if they're tested uh, for SARS-CoV-2 infection and uh, compared and contrasted to um, those who had positive tests and negative tests. And of course, how, how certain can we be that a, positive, that a negative was truly negative, uh, uh, and especially if there'd been some exposure in that. But if we generally accept that a negative test means they didn't have a SARS-CoV-2 infection, a positive test meant they did. That, that uh, one highlight point just to remind people is that a lot of the symptoms that were ex ex incur experienced by uh, children in our study were nonspecific and, and not a lot different between those who were um, SARS-CoV-2 positive and SARS-CoV-2 negative. Um, and then in terms of sort of the trends of, of, of infection, because so many of the children who were positive in, in our study were positive during Omicron, um, it's a little hard to uh, compare with uh, statistical confidence um, the symptoms and signs uh, pre-Omicron versus post-Omicron because so many infections took place during the Omicron time. Um, and so just uh, wanted to offer that as well. Great, thanks, Jim. And, and I think very importantly, the, the, the population perspective on symptomatology might look different from the, what you see in the emergency room. Uh, in terms of the numbers in particular. Um, so, and I noticed that uh, one of the studies, I think it was yours, showed uh, uh, detection of infection in many children who did not test positive or did not have any symptoms. Uh, so those, that's another part of the equation. Um, great, thanks. I'm, I'm going to give uh, Dr. Friedman a little rest. Uh, there is another question, but I'm gonna go to Dr. Uh, Dr. Caroline Quach. And with this question about, could the lower level of detectable nucleocapsid antibody levels seen pre-Omicron in children be due to a better capacity of children with their innate immune response to earlier variants that were less infective? Consequently, they did not produce um, a strong, as strong an antibody response. Can you comment on that? Uh, hypothesis? I think um, it's an interesting hypothesis. I haven't seen anything that would firmly support that. We did see, however, in the literature that children tended to have lower humoral response, so antibody response, when they were infected with COVID. We do know that they have a good innate immunity, but whether or not there is a difference between Omicron and the previous variants, I don't know. What we did see though, so I didn't present those data, but at the same time as ANCORE was happening, we were doing residual blood testing in our ERs to see the sort of prevalence rate. So just to compare, um, so different populations, same region in Montreal, but venous tests versus um, dry blood spots. And so during round three, our anti-nucleocapsid um, antibody seropositivity at St. Justin was higher for both uh, the, for all age groups. So comparing 
um, what uh, uh, the data from Angkor where the seroprevalence rate was around 10%, we had 25% in the two to four, 30% in the five to 11 and 53% compared to 20 something percent in the 12 to 17. So there might be, um, as the, the, the question um, was raising previously, a difference in terms of sensitivity of the analysis when done by DBS. And it's something that it might be um, just due to the quantity of blood that was available, but uh, whether or not everything can be um, due to the be better innate uh, immune response, I don't know. We just know that the Omicron was much more transmissible. And I think that's when children were most exposed. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Kellner, uh, amongst those with persistent SARS-CoV-2 positive tests, did these individuals continue to exhibit symptoms? So I just want to uh, clarify, I'm not 100% sure what the question is asking, because if the, uh, there's, of course, the two kinds of tests. There's the antigen test to see if you have an infection, which is either the uh, PCR test done through a lab or the rapid tests um, done, but uh, uh, after you've had some kind of a nasal or oral swab, and that testing is done to see if you have a positive antigen indicating presence of the virus today. Um, and that's on the one hand compared with the antibody tests um, it, uh, through blood sampling, either the drug blood spots or venous sampling to determine if you've made antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. And um, so um, in the data that I showed, we only show data on, uh, uh, we only have data on um, uh, positive tests done. Some, some of the children had recurrent infections and about 7% of children had a second or more infection. Uh, but uh, in, in general reporting data on children who had a positive test and then didn't go on and have further positive antigen tests. So we, we, don't, we didn't present and don't have data on uh, persistence of a positive antigen test. So I, I don't think that's the uh, a question that was being asked, but if it is, it's, that's not something that uh, there was data presented on. And so as far as the antibodies go, that, you, you know, the testing where you look at, say, what's the duration of uh, positive antibody tests, children would have repeated blood tests done at the intervals and had persistent positive antibody tests um, done showing that they had made an immune response with resolution of, of symptoms. So, but the question I think is about persistent symptoms and, you know, when Dr. Friedman presented about their um, data from the emergency department perspective, looking at the persistence of symptoms, we um, asked uh, children every, and, and families every time they came for four or five visits uh, to report on symptomatic episodes and, uh, and uh, that they uh, had had uh, during that period. And they reported on new acute symptoms um, that they would have had through there. Through that, we had no signal of, of uh, any number of children having any ongoing kind of persistent symptoms related to a first time that they had had uh, a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So it's a bit of a meandering response there, but I just want to make sure that it's clear about the distinction between um, the antigen uh, tests looking at acute infection and the antibody tests that response to the um, to the infection. Great. Uh, thanks very much uh, for that answer. Um, we're going to open it up. Uh, this is free for all four of the panelists, whoever would like to volunteer to uh, take this question first. In adults and older adults, we see different rates of anti-nucleocapsid seroconversion with different Omicron variants. So this is different variants of Omicron. Uh, are you able to break them down by specific variants in your cohorts? Uh, and we also see slower serial revision, uh, reversion after reinfection. Were you able to see this in, if, if this occurred with children? So there's really two questions there related to rates of anti-nucleocapsid serial uh, conversion and being different according to different Omicron variants. And then a second question about uh, slower serial reversion after reinfection versus a first infection. So question, were you able to observe any of this in your cohorts? Floor is open. 
I, I can go first if you want. Um, so I think for our for our cohort, we so we do have linkage with our participants and the provincial testing that has occurred that's been done by PCR. And I think some of the challenge with the question specifically around Omicron variants is that essentially since Omicron sort of had a huge increase, PCR testing has really dried up a lot. Um, and so most of the positives that are being reported are on rapid antigen tests that are being done by parents at home, and we don't have any variant data for that. And so we have some of the early part of the cohort where we've got the PCR data that we can link to from the provincial testing database. Anyone later on who had PCR testing, then we can get that, and, and they had variant testing done, which isn't 100%, we can get that information. Um, but a lot of the time we're relying on sort of the predominant circulating variant in the population um, and sort of extrapolating based based on that. So that's that's the best that, that we can do for, for the cohort. In terms of the serial reversion, I know that others have presented more about that, but I think that we're, we're doing that analysis right now for our data sets. That's um, work in progress. Great. All right, anyone like to add to anything Dr. Sadarangani has provided? No? I'll just add that it's that's a work in progress with us right now. It, but to reiterate the point that with uh, Omicron, so little antigen testing, two thirds of the children, we do have access in all the cases to antigen testing uh, uh, that was done in the labs and also reports of uh, rapid testing. But in our last two uh, uh, collection periods, um, when the vast majority, uh, so we can you know extrapolate that it was done, you know likely uh, Omicron infections, but two thirds of the children who reported a positive test uh, for SARS-CoV-2 infection, it was on the basis of a rapid test, um, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, you, you know it's going to look different the results that come from that. But you can do it because it, yeah, as Omicron got going, it was only Omicron that was around, or, or mostly that was around. So uh, more to come on that. We will um, um, uh, be able to comment confidently on that as, as we finish our analysis. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I have. Um, uh, a few more questions here. Um, uh, uh, any sense of rates of reinfection or severe outcomes between children who've been infected versus vaccinated versus having hybrid immunity, hybrid immunity being both infection and having been infected and also be, having been vaccinated? Uh, with adults and older adults, there's enough data to suggest that reinfections are problematic and should be avoided. But I don't see a lot of information to help with messaging with kids. This is open to anybody who can give some advice on what about children when it comes to the risks of reinfection. Dr. Quach. I can try and tackle this one. I think that the most of our data are, are difficult to interpret in that sense, just because as the, the other speakers have said, we do not have any PCR data for anyone after January 2022, at least in Quebec. And so to identify reinfections becomes quite problematic. Um, in the adult population, it's true that the rate of reinfection, uh, it, well, I mean, it, pre, prior to Omicron, the rate of reinfection in one of our study was four per 100,000 person years, which is not super high, but not zero. Um, and most of the time, the reinfections were um, not severe outcomes, but in a population of healthy healthcare workers. So it really depends on your underlying um, history from as a clinical perspective. And I think my colleagues can jump in. We haven't seen an increase in severe outcomes for SARS-CoV-2. We've seen actually a decrease in MIS-C, as I think Stephen mentioned. Um, and we've also seen data showing that vaccination actually is effective in preventing MIS-C in the order of 90 something percent um, as reported by the Americans. So from a clinical perspective, and we I, I at least don't have any um, inclined to say that reinfection is worse in children and to quantify it is actually quite difficult uh, given the data, the presentation, all the other viruses going around and lack of testing. Okay, I see lots of shaking heads in the positive direction and agreement, um, which uh, I think uh, just waiting to see and um, 
Uh, I'm going to jump to the next question because uh, uh, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, if you collected information on comorbidities, did you find that children with chronic respiratory diseases, uh, such as asthma, represented a significant proportion of Delta Omicron COVID admissions slash ED visits? Dr. Friedman, you may be best to, uh, to opine on this, but others can also offer their observations. So we, we did collect data on comorbidities and asthma and prior episodes of pneumonia. Um, we cannot compare it to the rates in the community because all we know is um, the rates among the children who presented to the emergency department. Um, we looked at whether those were associated with severe outcomes. I haven't looked or seen any studies really looking at associating these conditions with the hospitalization or admission. And what we did find is um, that children with comorbidities, but not including asthma, so asthma separate, um, we did not find it, let me rephrase this a different way. We did not find any strong association between asthma and severe outcomes in and of itself. We did find associations between prior episodes of pneumonia, as well as other comorbidities. And so we looked at neurologic being one of the common ones that were associated with severe outcomes, particularly in the early days. Um, the rates of infection in general, particularly in the first couple of waves of uh, COVID, were lower or very few kids with significant chronic comorbidities were getting infected. I think the families really were um, very adherent, obviously, to public health precautions to try to avoid it. Um, and uh, so bottom line is, yes, comorbidities were associated with hospitalization, uh, or I should say severe outcomes, but asthma in and of itself was not one of those high-risk features that we were uh, particularly worried about. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. So last question, uh, this is for all of you. Um, uh, what is your advice to parents uh, uh, with respect to uh, uh, the timing of a booster for their children, assuming they've been vaccinated? When should they next be vaccinated? I'll ask each of you to give your advice on this uh, because I'm sure this is uh, not uh, uh, at the moment proven in the literature in terms of what is best, uh, but uh, it, I'm sure there are lots of parents out there who would appreciate your expert opinions. I'll begin with Dr. So, Elkin. Yeah, I mean, you're ending with a, a very difficult question. Uh, <laughs> trying to be, uh, yes, very brief. So as you say, there, there's no evidence to guide what should be done at any age now for continued boosters uh, with uh, and in our context with the mRNA vaccines. And, um, you know, there's this sense that endless um, periodic mRNA boosters are, are not the answer, um, but what is what will be the alternative answers? We simply don't know yet, and it becomes all speculation. Um, I think that with children, as with older adults, the, the, the main thing would be to say that if you look at this uh, fortunately smaller proportion of children that are at uh, really significantly increased risk of severe outcomes, those are children for whom you should consider, uh, the, 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 for whom the parents should consider uh, ensuring that they have booster doses. And this is, these are children who are re, you know, really considerably higher risk because of uh, 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 very significant underlying comorbidities. Do children who have no other underlying health conditions um, and uh, are, are otherwise healthy um, need a booster dose at this time with, uh, you, you know, sort of where we're at with the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic worldwide, where there's still infection around? Um, and what we see, especially in the adult world, is, you know, the, the, the severe outcomes really uh, focus more on those with um, uh, very advanced age. Um, and so um, it's a bit hard to extrapolate that to children. But uh, the, the short answer to my question is if your child has significant, very significant underlying uh, comorbidities, yes, consider uh, booster doses, uh, but um, uh, not indefinitely and, and, and eventually will be better informed and uh, better armed for uh, the vaccine approach going forward. This is not to say that vaccines are not an important part of, of uh, uh, prevention of future SARS-CoV-2 infections. Right. Thank you. Um, I saw, again, a consensus on your response based on interpretation with my chat GPT generative AI of the other three panelists. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists um, for an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, panel discussion, uh, really illuminating.
And I'd just like to congratulate you all personally, but also your teams uh, for, for producing first-rate research, which is so important to understanding this critical uh, part of our, of our population. So thank you all for your, your great work and your service and for joining us today. Um, before we sign off, uh, I do have a few announcements. Uh, um, and uh, I, I'd like to um, thank our attendees uh, and for the excellent questions that we got over the transom. Uh, there will be a, summon, a summary of this seminar, and we'll make it available um, uh, as usual on the CITF website. Uh, we'll also be posting a recording of this seminar um, in the uh, coming days. The presentation is already on the website as a PDF in case you would like uh, to see or share it. Um, if you receive the CITF weekly newsletter, uh, you will be informed as to when everything is up on the page. If you don't receive our newsletter yet and would like to, please go to CITF websites, uh, the CITF website's homepage and sign up at the bottom. Um, so with that, uh, thanks. Uh, it's been 17 seminars uh, that we've had over the past two years. Uh, this is our final seminar. And uh, with that, I'd also just like to I uh, uh, provide a brief call out uh, to our fantastic team uh, who have orchestrated these all um, uh, over uh, 17 uh, and also um, uh, our, our, our logistical facilitators in terms of the webinar. They've all run extremely smoothly, but most importantly, thanks to the thousands of people who've attended. Uh, we hope you've learned something from these seminars and uh, we wish everybody uh, safety in the days ahead and look forward to keeping in touch with you. Thanks again. Everybody take care.